You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Welcome to New Earth. Let us cure you. We can cure anything. Portray syndrome. Terminal. Wrong. We never lose a patient. We're here to help you. Donations welcome. Come to New Earth and be cured. Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon of Rassilon. Correct. talking about the first episode of the second series of Doctor Who, New Earth, which aired April 15th, 2006. Two facts! And we have a returning guest, though this is his first New Who episode, uh, Mike Gordon is with us. Howdy! Yes, New Year, New Who. <laughs> new Earth, New Everything. Yeah. New New York. <laughs> new, 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 yeah, well, that's a lot of news, right? This is our first episode we've recorded in the new year. It's not our first episode we've dropped, but this is our first episode in the new year. Yeah. Which means we've now, we haven't talked about it on the podcast, but now we've seen Shudigatwa, which was, yeah, good. Absolutely, yeah. I, now, have you guys watched any new Who before? Or is this, so is this a rewatch? So this is a rewatch for me. This is yes, a rewatch. Yeah, it's a rewatch. Yeah. We've, okay. we've seen all of New Who. So. Gotcha, okay. That's what I thought, but I wasn't sure. Now I've seen all of Doctor Who. Oh my well, gosh. Interesting watching it with more context. I, I cannot say that. I am envious because I have not seen every episode of Doctor Who. Uh, we when, uh, when we do our show, or Station Who, we uh, pick stories at random. And uh, so we've never really actually gone in order. So there's some gaps that I have from cla- the classic series, which I'm eager to explore. Well, I should say some of them I'm eager to explore. <laughs> Others I'm kind of like, oh, we'll, we're, we'll, we'll wait. This is very fair. Yeah. So uh, what you're saying is we've won. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Congratulations. In the contest of who has wasted more of their own time, we have won. <laughs> so... Uh, there might be people who are listening to this who maybe didn't listen to our classic Who episodes and are only tuning in for new Who stuff, so they may not know who you are. Tell the people who you are. I appreciate that. Uh, again, uh, this is Mike Gordon, and uh, I am a co-host of the podcast Earth Station One as well as Earth Station Who. Uh, I also do a podcast called The Dragon Con Report, which uh, airs once a month uh, to talk about that wonderful show that we all love. And uh, yeah, I do. I appear on other podcasts as well. I also am a writer and uh, have uh, written some comics and books and whatnot. We'll probably dive into that a little more at the end for plugs too. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. But uh, I always love talking about Doctor Who. Um, so, and, and and I don't get a chance to. We we reviewed this episode quite some time ago. So this has been a while since I've rewatched it, and this one is uh, one of my favorites. So it's, I was glad to revisit it. Uh, speaking of uh, this episode, I'm going to do a quick summary that I've written up and I've not read since I wrote it up. So let's see if it makes any sense. I also give alternate titles for the episode because I used to give titles to the individual classic Who episodes. Absolutely. And now, and now I give a little alternate titles <laughs> for this episode of New Earth, which I have called Skin Care. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> the Doctor and Rose arrive on New Earth to respond to a distress call the Doctor received on his psychic paper. They go to a hospital run by cats where they run into a familiar face of Bo. Hiding out in the hospital is the newly reformed flap of skin, Cassandra. Cassandra lures Rose into a trap and transfers her consciousness into Rose's body. She snogs the doctor, and together they try to figure out what's going on in this hospital. What's going on is that the cats have a large batch of clones that they've given every disease to so they can figure out cures. The diseased break free and begin infecting everyone. After more running around and body swapping, 
The doctor gives everyone a medicine cocktail shower, healing everyone. The doctor has a chat with the face of Bo that is very mysterious. Meanwhile, Cassandra has wound up in the body of her clone henchman who is dying. And the doctor and Rose take her back in time to meet herself when she was still a human. She tells herself that she's beautiful and dies in her own arms. The end. I truly appreciate how sweet that moment is. (laughs) Even though it's so unhinged. Yeah. So, uh, how was my recap? Was it good? It was good. Sweet. Awesome. You sometimes grade me, so... I'm, like, nervous about it. Uh, It was a solid B+. Okay. I think we have mentioned many times on this podcast before that, like, especially as we went through all of Classic Who, there were many times, I think, where we were, like, even the, like, bad episodes of Doctor Who have something really good in them. With Mm -hmm. this episode, like, everybody gets to play Cassandra, and that's so good. You have the little shop line, and that's so good. Then the rest of it? happens (laughs) happens <laughs> yeah there's some stuff in this that i'm like i don't know if this makes sense but it's fine none of it's how anything works <laughs> well it's the future okay if you you can't give someone every disease an attempt to cure every disease that doesn't make sense you're just confounding variables it's not science <laughs> There needs to be, like, one clone gets one disease. Yes! If you've got a million clones, and every clone has one singular disease, and then you work out how to solve each individual clone. And then, like... <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't do that, though, because that's ethically unsound, but... Okay, but it's at least scientific. Well, I mean, you're you're thinking like humans. These are cats <laughs> that are responsible for this. This is like the cat's way of thinking. God, that's you're right. True. It is classic cat behavior. <laughs> I mean, yeah, cats are just all or nothing. <laughs> they don't care about individual diseases. It's like just dump all the diseases on them. They don't, yeah, they don't really care. They just knocked it off the table. Yeah, as long as no one like drops a little ball of string or something, they're fine. <laughs> but also, it seems like all the diseases they have are all ones they already have cures for. So why leave them sick? Good question. You know what I mean? They should have new diseases. They should all have COVID-19 is what I'm saying. Like, they should all have stuff that doesn't have a cure yet. Yeah. But they just had the cures sitting around. No, they they were they got the cures by testing them. I'm, I'm guessing that they, like, every time a new patient came in, it had a new disease. So they added it to the mix. Because otherwise you wouldn't need, you're right, you wouldn't need so many compartments. You wouldn't actually need to do it more than once. If you just dumped everything. So they didn't have access to everything. So they just added it as they came in, which I'm giving this a lot more thought than I ever have. Um, (laughs) And uh, which is fine. To be honest with you, it's not the particulars of the story that I think about a lot when I think about this episode. I really like it a lot for a lot of different reasons that I'm sure we'll get into. But um, a lot of times with Doctor Who, the, the, the science doesn't add up. And Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things, it's kind of like you, with Doctor Who, you just sort of like take the, the science as well as the special effects, and you kind of say, okay, because Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> I do think there is a easy enough fix for this, or to me, at least make it a little bit less ridiculous, is to just be like, oh, they have 50 diseases, and not literally every disease, because that's not a 50. lot. 50. I don't know, that's a more tangible number. No, that's a bizarre thing you just said. I I think it would be better if they just said, no, it's just an amount of diseases. Well, an amount... That changes nothing. (laughs) It sounds more plausible than every. They'd be like saying they have like 10 diseases or they have infinite diseases. (laughs) No, I don't think it matters. I guess not. (laughs) The thing about Doctor Who that I find kind of fascinating is that, like, you can't apply the same level of, like, thought to every episode where you're like, this one's just very fun and don't think about it too much, which is fine, which is some episodes are like that. But what's fascinating about Doctor Who is, like, I feel like a lot of times it's like shows are like that, whereas with Doctor Who it's like individual episodes are like that. There are still some episodes... Where it's like, well, you know, it's like, is RTD writing it or is Moffat writing it? Or <laughs> yeah, that's a big difference. That's a, that's a huge difference. And RTD never cares about exact science. RTD oh, does not no, give a shit, and I respect that. <laughs> I want to be very clear. <laughs> I mean, he he's not subtle at all. 
Like, you know, when, with the things that he's trying to say, with the concepts that he has, it's like, he's like, I'm just doing this to prove a point. Like, the, the resolution to this episode is literally, what if we just put all of the medicine in a blender and just poured it on people? But again, that's not the point of this episode. The point of this episode is to watch uh, David Tennant and Billy Piper get to play a very campy person. <laughs> like, yeah. that's why this episode exists, and it's great at that. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, specific. I read uh, specifically Billy Piper was like, I'd like to be funny in an episode. So uh, RTD wrote this one especially for her so she could she could uh, ham it up a little bit. Nice. She was magnificent. Yeah, she really is. Uh, she really does knock it out of the park with her portrayal of Cassandra. It, it's just, you know, amazing. I think uh, up until this point, she wasn't given enough credit. You know, I think a lot of people saw her as a pop singer turn actor and not really serious as an actor. They just said, oh, she's a pretty face that, you know, that they just popped in the show. So any chance she gets to really do something either fun or with emotional weight, I think is always a treat because she does them really well. With David, um, it's so weird. You know, it's like this is 2006. <laughs> just watched the 60th anniversary special. Love watching David. He's so damn young in this. He feels like a little boy. Like it's just, it, it's like he's so young. He's still got the freckles. I mean, it's just amazing to me, and it makes me feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, baby Tennant. That is like when we watched the first episode with David Tennant, and it was at the same time that the 60th was airing, and it was just like, oh, that's a that is that's a child. <laughs> <laughs> It really is surprising how how old he's become, and I guess that means I've gotten older, too. <laughs> That's how time works, I guess. I'm well, you know, it. timey-wimey, so, you know. I am against the forward progression of time, likewise. <laughs> Which is probably why you're such a Doctor Who fan. Yeah. <laughs> so, talking about Cassandra, there are actually five different incarnations of Cassandra in this episode. Wow, I didn't count, but yeah. You got the flat skin Cassandra, you got human Cassandra, mm. you got Rose Cassandra, Dr. Cassandra, and uh, Chip. Chip, is that his name? Mm -hmm. I forgot. Chip Cassandra. I'm obsessed with Chip. I, I love Chip as a concept. <laughs> <laughs> it does cause like a paradox thing with the, Cassandra's the one that told herself this thing that she's, that sort of changed who she is as a person almost. And I think she also gets the idea for how Chip looks. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think about that, but yeah. It's copying Must be. that guy who said something nice to her. At first, you know, I was like, why doesn't she just jump into her back in her own body? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, she could have. Like, at that point, there, I don't know what, there was nothing really stopping her. I mean, she said she wanted to die, or she, it was time to die. But she could have just been like, hey, there's my young self. Thanks, Doc. Whoop, and then jumped right back, right in. And then, man, that would have caused some trouble. Maybe she secretly did, and that's a big finish. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's when Chip died. Died, yeah. And she was like, oh, help me with this dead body. I, I'm sure you're using quotes when you say that. Yeah. Died? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see the quotes. <laughs> I can hear them. I sometimes forget this is an audio-only medium. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, I, I understand. How would you rank the Cassandra performances? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. They were all A pluses all around. The thing is, <laughs> love a body swap episode. Let's start there. Mm -hmm. Everything's going right when, like, at some point, I'm like, oh yeah, this is fiction. <laughs> <laughs> These are actors playing this character, and they're doing a very good job. Uh, as opposed to like, man, they're not. <laughs> they don't get it. Like, there's stuff that they don't get. There's no point where it doesn't feel like Cassandra is not just hopping around these people. Yeah, mm -hmm. like. There's something that everybody gets in the performance, and I think what it is is just that it's very fun. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, it's very campy. Everybody's having fun hamming it up, like, and I think that's crucial. <laughs> I think it's uh, great, especially for Rose, because, or Billy Piper, because Billy Piper has to play Rose. She has to play Cassandra in Rose's body, and then she has to play Cassandra in Rose's body pretending to be, to be Rose. Rose. Which is yes. fun. Yes. And doing terrible cockney slang. <laughs> <laughs> also, I feel like this episode may have had the most innuendo in it that we've had in a while. Bouncy Castle and 
all that stuff. <laughs> oh yeah, and there's a couple times where they cut right before you know they have those creative cuts where they save us from having what having a character swear right. The yeah the bit rich and uh, ask. So those are those are those are kind of raunchy for a, a quote unquote kids show right. Yeah, the only thing that bugged me about the uh, almost cursing is they didn't do it a third time. They only did it twice. Ah, uh, the rules of comedy, right? Three? Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly. right. Oh, I was just waiting for it to to pay off for a third time, and it didn't, and I felt, like, incomplete. Unfinished. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other thing that's uh, uh, that's really subtle that I noticed this time is that when Cassandra takes over not Rose's body, which I thought this would apply to, but when she takes over the doctor's body, she references to some parts that have been quote unquote, hardly used. And I was like, Whoa. <laughs> oh, I just realized there was a sixth Cassandra. She also possessed, she one, of the possessed infected. one of the infected. I love that scene afterwards where you have this just sort of like bitchy villain who has this moment of like sincere empathy and, I mean, it kind of changes, like, the doctor's attitude towards her from that point on as well. Wow, it means you can play six degrees of Cassandra with herself. <laughs> the only thing I could think of after she pos- possessed the infected, and then, Was like... Was that the extra had to get paid more? Yeah, that extra <laughs> had one line, so she got paid more. <laughs> <laughs> she Like, it gives her empathy because she's, like, experiencing things from a different viewpoint. Yeah, it's somebody who ha- probably has never experienced empathy, literally, like, physically having empathy happen to her, mm-hmm. and it, like, takes her out of herself. I don't know. I, I really, really like that scene. They missed an opportunity, though. They should have had her, you know, jump into the face of Bo for a minute. Ooh. Ooh. That would have been interesting. Because we don't really get into, um, a reason why he wakes up. He not only wakes up, but I don't know. I just looked at, he looked younger to me. Like when when at we when he's when the doctor saw him at the end when he was awake. Some of the special effects don't hold up. There's a lot of effects in this episode, but I think most of them do hold up, and particularly the makeup. The makeup done on the cats. Oh, so good, iconic, really now because you see that you see that all the time in in conventions and everything, and it's just a great look. The sort of makeup puppet. Uh, effects of the the face of Bo. Once again, we see him. Uh, this is the second time, I think, right? Yep. I believe so. Well, technically, you see him a little bit on the TV screens that says he's pregnant. Oh, in um, the TV one. Yeah. The long game? <laughs> the the yeah. long game. I'll never remember. But he's not like actually, game. actually in that episode. It's just it, there's like a news story about him. Uh, the All the infected. The other patients that are sick and ill, like, it just, everything looks believable. The makeup is great all, all the way around. I give them credit, too. I don't know whose idea it was, if this came from makeup or Billy Piper herself or whatever. But whenever she's playing Cassandra, she actually has a slightly different shade of lipstick and she's wearing a wonder bra. <laughs> It's yeah, it's just like a very subtle little improvement there to differentiate the characters. I mean, I think at the time Wonder Bras were like the thing. I don't know if they still are, but I do remember that there was a big you know thing about Wonder Bras back then. I don't know anything about fashion, <laughs> nor do I. But I know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Wonder Bras? <laughs> I don't. I'm not opposed to them. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and the uh, CGI effects—they're more of a mixed bag. But Cassandra looks great. Mm-hmm. Uh, she looked great in her first episode. They bring back the spiders from her first episode very briefly at the beginning of the episode. Uh, they look mildly better to me. They look pretty much the same. Those little mechanical spiders. The flying uh, cars, those don't look great. <laughs> no, you don't see them for very long. When they're on the meadow and the cars are flying over and they're trying to use the shadows of the cars or whatever, it, yeah, it doesn't really work. But I do love the landscape of new new york yeah the building structure the the, what the building looks like of the hospital the big green moon i think that looks pretty amazing speaking of that scene it is very obvious that they are redoing their lines that they're they're dubbed over (laughs) wherever they were it was windy as heck (laughs) yeah (laughs) on the uh doctor who confidential they are like yeah we're gonna have to just redo all of our lines because it is so windy they had to like shuffle the filming schedule and it wasn't 
it was a different time of year and the the weather was bad. Uh, what when they originally planned to do it, it would have been better. That sort of thing. But it looks pretty, but you can tell it is so windy. Also in that scene, something happened that Tony and I did not remember from our first couple times watching it. The, the grapes. Oh, yeah, I learned some shit. <laughs> uh, the grapes. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, you have me at a loss. When they're heading to the hospital, Rose says, Let's go get grapes. And Joe and I were like, what the hell does that mean? She said it like it means something. And apparently in the UK, like, you know, how if you go to the hospital to visit someone, you bring flowers or something. In the UK, apparently you bring you grapes. You bring grapes. It's just, it's a thing people do. Yeah. Interesting. I, I just thought it was just some weird random thing she was saying. Well, what's crazy is I have watched this episode multiple times. I've never questioned that before. I don't even remember hearing it. That's why I'm like, I'm almost wondering, is there like an American edit where someone cut that line out? <laughs> I mean, we watched it on HBO Max, so. Yeah, yeah that's why I watched it, it as well. <laughs> but no, I have no idea what happened uh, after that because I was madly Googling grapes. grapes. Yeah. <laughs> UK gra- Well, you're like... I just said, Google hospital grapes, and you wouldn't Google that. No, I was Googling the whole sentence like it was a phrase people said. Yeah, and you just kept getting transcripts from this episode. <laughs> and Americans being like, what does this mean? <laughs> yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I didn't catch that, and that, that's, new, that's new to me. I will give you something um, that I picked up on that I doubt anybody... I would be surprised, you know, if too many people have picked up on this at all or, or referenced this or or know this. But and I just happen to be doing research for something. And the idea of a new New York actually is referenced in a comic from the Golden Age from the 1940s. Uh, there's a comic that was called uh, Prize Comics, and it's actually issue number four. And it features a superhero known as Power Nelson. He is the future man. His adventures take place in the uh, futuristic capital city of New New York and uh, in the year of 1982. <laughs> I always love that. So, <laughs> I was like, wow. Not that I thought that Doctor Who was being very innovative in coming up with New New York, but I didn't really have anything concrete to say like it had come before. Like there was a New New York before this, but there apparently was at least once. In a way, in, in a comic. Isn't there a new New York in Futurama as well, I think? Would that be after this? Yeah, that would be after this. Yeah. But that's the only other thing I could think of that had new New York. Uh, speaking of, like, little bits of trivia. So in the first appearance of Cassandra, she says, when she was a boy, and apparently there is a, uh, there was like a encyclopedia thing that was released and uh, RTD wrote some stuff for it. And it was like a who's who of who sort of thing. <laughs> uh, but in this uh, this book, uh, it said that Cassandra was born Brian Edward Cobbs. That was Cassandra's name originally before. So th- this is our first canon trans character, trans Cassandra. Wow, look at Russell slipping that in. <laughs> Transandra, if you will. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought that was neat. Yeah, absolutely. 2006, I mean. Yeah, it's pretty it's probably a first. Yeah, there's no, like, I don't think there's, like, any real, because it's, like, a joke attached to it either, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. there could be. So, yeah, that's cool. Wow, so another version of Cassandra. <laughs> that's true. Also, a thing I noticed at the very beginning of this episode, what, before they leave Earth, r- or regular Earth, old, old Earth, they say goodbye to Jackie and Mickey. If you look on the ground, you can see the bad wolf graffiti yeah, that's been like really faded out. Yeah, Russell likes to play the long game and throw stuff in there. So it was, I thought it was a nice little bit of continuity to sort of like connect you to the season that came before. You know, uh, we don't get Torchwood this episode though. There's no Torchwood mention, mm-hmm. which is the new Bad Wolf. The new Bad Wolf, yeah, it's Torchwood. But yeah, that won't be until next episode. Actually, we've had two Torchwood mentions previously uh, in the Christmas episode and in the finale of last season. I. Forgot that there was a Torchwood mention. It was one of the answers for the Weakest Link parody. Oh, interesting. The only episode of the first season that doesn't mention Bad Wolf is Rose. So maybe that's just like, mm. in the first episode of the season, I'm not going to mention <laughs> the the phrase. <laughs> What's the season threes? Is it the Saxon thing? I believe so. So we'll have to see if it's mentioned in the first episode of season three. And then it will be a pattern. 
Yeah. I read this is the first story of the Revive series, like since it came back, set on an alien planet. Which I, I was like, really? Like, Eccleston's Doctor never went on an alien planet? And I thought about it, and, and I was like, no, I guess not. Satellites and stuff, but never a planet. S- yeah, satellites and stations, but not a planet. And it's interesting that this is the first one to be set on an alien planet, and yet this planet is called New Earth. <laughs> They still haven't been on a planet, not Earth yet. <laughs> this is the first time they've been on a Earth that's not uh, in the UK. This is like, <laughs> this is New York. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The farthest they've ever been, and it's America. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely been allusions to other planets, but never we never actually saw it. I've never really considered that before. Yeah, I didn't realize it either. And at this point, you know, I was watching Doctor Who in order. Now with Classic Who, you know, I still, like I said, I have enough, uh, a lot of gaps, so I don't know, you know, sometimes when things happen in what order. But as far as New Who, I mean, I've been watching that in order since it debuted. So I saw this pretty early on and I was familiar with like, you know, everything that had come before and and I was watching it on a regular basis at that point. To be honest with you, I don't remember how I watched this. I assume with your eyes. I, yes. Uh, I did use those. But in terms of... Because Doctor Who, even when it came back, was not really like out there. So you had to really hunt for it. And uh, sometimes you had to get it through less than legal means. <laughs> what? Which is probably how I saw it. But I, I'm not sure if it was airing... On BBC America at that point, or where? So, or I think sci-fi. it also aired on Sci-Fi. Yeah, yeah. So I know it's gone through different different networks. So, hmm. how did you first see it? I've been sitting here trying to remember this whole time. I don't know. <laughs> when it used to air in somewhere because I think I would TiVo it in America. This was first aired. I think you're right. Uh, I think it was on Sci-Fi, but I think I was able to acquire copies prior to that. I think the first time I watched it, it was streaming, so... Because I didn't start watching it from 9 until, I think, 11 or 12 was yeah. there. So... By that time, we could stream it. You know, I'd seen the Christmas Invasion, and I was very, you know... I was impressed with David, but I was still really a big fan of Chris Eccleston. And this is this is David's first, you know, real go. I remember watching this thinking... That I, this won me over, you know, I think the Christmas invasion was like, oh, it's, it's, it's nice. Um, and I, you know, I, but I didn't really get, the, he slept through most of it. Right. So you're kind of like, okay, he shows up at the end in the third act and you're kind of like, okay, well, this is, this is interesting. But then this is the first time we really get to see him. And I, I have to give Russell and them credit because I think, you know, midway through the episode, he has a, a scene and, a, and in particular, a quote that is one of my favorite Doctor Who moments ever. He's questioning, and he's really angry, <laughs> very angry. And he's questioning the what the what the what the cat nurses are doing. One of them says, "Like, well, you know, who are you to judge us?" And he's like, "I'm the Doctor. If you want to take it to a higher authority, there is none. Like, it stops with me." And he says it with such authority that I it. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, "Holy crap!" I've just He owned that moment. And to me, it was like a great doctor moment. Here's the thing about that, too, is like, for me, when I was watching it, like, it is very clearly setting up the, like, you know, Time Lord Victorious thing. Sure. It's very cool, but it's also like, this is the seed. This is not great. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This is the seed of of the doctor having too big of of an ego or whatever. But also, like, there is this, like, common, like, Eccleston was dark and broody and Tennant was bright and fun and stuff yeah but i don't see that at all like having just recently rewatched everything eccleston's very goofy Mm -hmm. and like right out of the bat tenant pretty much is you know dark and angry yeah he goes from being really goofy and excited like a little kid like hey there should be shops here and all this kind of fun stuff to majorly angry angry like he just goes off on these women and i'm not saying he's wrong right but man he there's no like sort of like well i can kind of see both sides or what you're doing but no he goes right into i am a angry time lord and i will destroy you mode i mean that even happens in uh christmas invasion a little bit when he just straight up kills that guy who's like no second chances yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Like he's he's got this sort of like weird dark side that he he it comes out very uh not every episode I don't think, but it comes out like I'm I was surprised that it I was surprised that it's here so early, uh, but I do remember that. What I didn't remember was that this is the first time where he says the line, I'm sorry, I'm so, so sorry. Like, I was like, oh my God, it's like, it's right here. Like, it's right here in his like <laughs> second appearance. Who does he say that to? Is it the zombies? And he says that to the the sick one as he's locking it back up. Like, you know, he's like, oh man, you're, you're, I'm sorry. Like I, but there's nothing I could do for you. So he just locks the door. <laughs> it's like, it's like, wow, you could, you know. Just opens the door and goes, ah, that's fucked. And then closes it. <laughs> I mean, there's not even a discussion. You know, they're cats, so they don't care about humans, really. And I get that because I live with enough of them that I know that they just don't <laughs> care. The Sisters of Plenty 2 just are like, they set their extensions. They just don't care about humans and how they work and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, the fact that they don't see these clones or zombies or whatever you want to call them, they don't see them as like real life forms. And it's debatable whether they're not. And I think Russell is putting that out there to have that discussion, but we don't get that discussion because the doctor immediately wants to shut it down. An interesting thing I read about this is that the whole cocktail medicine ending wasn't the original ending. Uh, It was originally going to be the doctor just mercy kills them all. Mm. Fuck. He's like, you know, this sucks for you. I'm going to to end your suffering sort of thing. A lot darker of an ending, which... I don't think works for this episode because it is so goofy and silly. But the, you'll never, you'll never guess who apparently proposed this alternate ending of everybody living. I'll never guess who decided just this once everyone lives. I <laughs> was it Moffat? Yeah, that idea was pitched by Moffat. <laughs> I don't know why, but there's something about that that's so sweet to me. <laughs> yeah, of like Moffat reading this script and was like. What if instead <laughs> <laughs> everything was fine, though? <laughs> That's like another thing. Like, every, I feel like people get their wires crossed with 9 and 10 about, like, the way they're perceived. I think that's also true of Moffat. Like, I feel like a lot of people are like, Moffat was the guy who was constantly killing people. And, and like, uh, he kind of doesn't. <laughs> Only to begin with. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, as is pointed out in one of the 60th anniversary specials, Moffat kills them, but then brings them back. That's all right, then. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. Well, that's all right, then. And I think Moffat has said about Russell T that he creates interesting characters and then he melts them. Yeah. And and, yeah. and 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 Steven's like that. That's you know we should keep some of them. Now I don't think the zombies are interesting characters as a concept. Yeah, but not like we don't care about like the individual. the individuals. Yeah. yeah, but to be fair to the sisterhood, I mean it is interesting. I mean I, obviously there is they do see that there is some sort of intelligence there, like forming from these zombie or clones or whatever you want to call them. So yes, that does sort of swing towards the doctor side where they should be saved and they shouldn't be treated like this. But you sort of think how long has that been happening? Because that's not the norm. Usually it's just a, like a B a body that doesn't have any personality. doesn't have any soul, doesn't have any thing. So, I mean, I have a theory about this actually. Oh yes, please. Yeah. Because they're like, Oh, they're talking now. They didn't, they didn't do that before. And I think, me, this is my theory, they possibly were trying to communicate, but they couldn't understand them, and the TARDIS showed up. Oh, with its translation circuit. Interesting. Yeah. So, once the doctor showed up, the nurses could actually understand what the uh, the clones were saying. I also find it interesting in this, too, that Cassandra cares. I mean, kind of. I mean, she she doesn't... Obviously, she's she's in it for herself. She wants to use it as leverage so that she can get paid and, and get a real body and, and whatnot from the nurses. But yet, she's like, you know, she's curious. She says, they're, I know they're doing something. They're doing something. And I think she's appalled by it as well. And she's the one who kind of opens up the vaults so that they can all roam around. Like, she's she seems to care in a way that I don't know if it's because... That's part of Rose in her. If she wouldn't do that, if she wasn't in Rose's body, but I find that I found it interesting. Watch, watching this, I thought Cassandra was like acting pretty uh, sympathetic towards them. Yeah, I think she's just picking up stuff from these bodies she's inhabiting because they're still there, just subdued. Yeah, because when she goes into one of the, the the clones and comes out, she's shell shocked. 
Yeah. Yeah. I will say that the 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 writing in this first few episodes of David's run with this one and then uh you know Tooth and Claw and uh, I think school reunions coming up pretty soon. I mean, they're really really solid. Like it really helped win me over. I was enjoying Christopher's run as 10 or as, as 9 so much that I didn't want it to end. Uh, I thought I thought it was very premature, and I was skeptical about because I had never seen David Tennant in anything before this. And now you can't watch <laughs> things without him being in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, it's like the exact opposite. But I was skeptical about the performer. The other thing about this too is, boy, it's really apparent here that they're two lovesick kids, uh, Rose oh, and the Doctor, yeah. like. Like it's not, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Like, and I didn't feel that with Rose and nine, but boy, right from the, I mean, she says something about this is our first date and, you know, the kiss and, uh, you know, Cassandra finds that, Hey, you're looking at him in a way that, you know, that, uh, you like him, you like the way he looks and that kind of thing. So, and, and they're playing off each other, like, like lovesick kids in the back of this classroom. Like they're just like... <laughs> I'm like, this is, I don't mind it, but it is interesting um, because they, I don't think, and I can see where a lot of people were taken aback by it, especially Classic Who fans, because it's not something that had ever been done before. Mm -hmm. This kind of relationship between the Doctor and the Companion had never been like this before, but it's right there from the beginning, or at least as far as David's run on it, it's right there from the beginning. And I think they have good chemistry. I think it was an interesting experiment to try. Uh, I don't know if it ultimately succeeded. I think a lot of people are still not not don't don't care for it. I have mixed feelings. I was gonna about say it. it depends on the day for me, to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, was it annoying for you in this? Like when you watch them banter back and forth because it, there's a flirtiness to it that wasn't there with with Chris, right? Yeah, no, I'm, I think I remember thinking that it was like cute enough. But then, like, as a, the season goes on overall, it gets to a point where it's like, okay, they are a little nauseating. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, if you've ever been friends with somebody who, like, just started dating, and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, they're in their first, like, real, real relationship, and you're like, okay, I just gotta, I just gotta wait this out till it cools down. <laughs> right. like, yeah, I've never been so thankful for a couple to fight before. <laughs> I do think it's there a little bit with Eccleston, especially in um, all of the episode that's about sex. <laughs> uh, the, doctor dances. Yeah, the doctor dances. I think it's there a little bit. Uh, but it's it's a different type of thing. I feel like he's more reserved and like doesn't want to admit it. Yeah. And then now he's just like, I don't care. I'm like, just going to be flirting. We are definitely flirting. Yeah. 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 And not just flirting. I mean, Cassandra. Now, granted, it's Cassandra. But Cassandra kisses him. And at that point, the doctor maybe suspects, but he doesn't know that it's not Rose. He just says, still got it. <laughs> and yeah, he's like, still got it. And he's, but he, and he's not opposed to it. He's not like, yeah, we didn't do that or whatever. Totally different reaction than we'll get like, you know, from other doctors, especially like Matt Smith's doctor would be like, no, like he'd be just be like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand this concept. <laughs> exactly. Which is ironic because he's, you know, the one that gets married. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's a pretty good episode. Um, I think we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back for final thoughts. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. All right. Then I'll put an ad here for something. Attention, people of Earth! Looking for a way to kill half an hour every week? Try the Flopcast! It's a silly podcast about cartoons, music, comics, movies, obscure pop culture from the 70s and 80s, and chickens. <laughs> Join us. Bring coffee. We're on the ESO network. And we're at flopcast.net. And we're back. Welcome back. Thanks. How was it? It was all right. How'd you find the ad break? Uh, I want to listen to whatever podcast ad I I put in there. I want to listen to that podcast. And the people listening should too. Yeah. (laughs) ESO network is awesome, isn't it? Yeah. I'm a fan. Uh, So do you know what time it is, Tony? Of course I do. What time is it? It is 12. Is that 5 or 4? It's 12.58. It's almost 1 o'clock. And you add, do you know what, what, what time it is in the <laughs> podcast? What we do at this point in the podcast? This bit exactly. Uh-huh. We go through the, we say this whole rehearsed bit. Rehearsed? Yeah. 
Oh, you're not practicing? No. Okay, well. I, I put no preparation into this <laughs> podcast. This is the only preparation that I do. Is this bit? Yeah. I think, hello? That's a very loud motorcycle. I, interrupting your bit. Interrupting my bit? That's so rude. <laughs> You you rehearsed for so long, and now there's a motorcycle. I spent a lot of time thinking about and rehearsing this bit, and now I'm thrown. I'm off my rhythm. It's time for final thoughts. <laughs> final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, it's the first full episode with uh, David Tennant's 10th Doctor, and he knocks it out of the park. I find that there's a lot of great Doctor moments, a lot of great Rose moments in this. Cassandra is a great foil, and I love the effects of and the makeup of the uh, sisterhood. Uh, yeah, I think this is a fun episode. I don't think it's the tightest written thing, but it doesn't need to be. It's just a fun romp. Uh, it's basically got to reintroduce Tin because we he's been in. Three episodes, and this is the first one that actually introduces him. And there's even a bit of this where he's not the Doctor. He's Cassandra. But it's it's a lot of fun. I love body swaps. Body swaps are fun. And, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a good start to the season. There was one scene that I didn't mention that I also really love, where it's just the Doctor and Rose are sending Cassandra back and forth, where they're like, <laughs> I'm so serious. Get out of them right now. <laughs> That's such a good bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is. It's it's a it's just a fun episode um, with some really great bits of design in it. I think the cat nuns are amazing. I always like it when we establish a bit of like lore about like mob is dangerous, Green Moon's mean hospital. I like the idea of like I don't know. There are things that are universal that everybody knows in the future, except that it... for Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I like that concept a bunch. And it was just a fun episode. You know what? I do want to mention one other thing we didn't mention. Uh, Cassandra exploded in her first episode, and now she's asking. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like it's important to note. It, it it does explain why she wanted to get out of there so fast and into <laughs> and, and into another body. She was not worried about being in another body before. Yeah. She was perfectly fine being a bitchy uh, trampoline. I'm I'm glad they didn't really emphasize it with like like a crack down the middle or something. So <laughs> <laughs> she's got a very flat ass, it seems. I and I, I like I said, I I appreciate this story. I appreciate the sisterhood. Whenever I see cosplayers at a con uh, doing the cat sister thing, it's just it's just it puts a smile on my face. And whenever somebody comes with a prop Cassandra, it's just awesome. It's just <laughs> awesome. I mean, she is a, one of the great characters. I'd, be, I'd like to see her again. I I don't know, just a thigh, Cassandra? Or... <laughs> I don't know. No, she's herself again. We already, oh, yeah, we already yeah. loopholed this. Yeah, she's uh, she's herself again. Yeah, All right. it's written right there. Come on, it's right, it's right there, guys. You don't have to even try to come up with an excuse. Big finish, jump on it. the The big finish adventures of Cassandra. I would, I would listen to those. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, before we go, is there anything you'd like to plug? Me. I plug a lot of things, <laughs> but uh, no, I appreciate it, guys. This is always fun to to join you guys and to talk about New Who is is really fun as well. I'm glad you're out of that classic era. I'm glad you survived. <laughs> <laughs> as far as where you can listen to me, uh, I am. Uh, we're taking a break on our station one for a little while. We should be back um, probably in the second quarter of the year somewhere uh, is what we're planning on. So we're working on some individual projects, including some other podcasts. So we're still doing Earth Station Who uh, every other week. And when there's new episodes, we'll do them as they come out. We'll re review them there. So that's a lot of fun. So I'm still talking Doctor Who a lot. I'm also talking about Dragon Con Report on uh, or Dragon Con on the Dragon Con Report podcast, uh, which uh, airs every month. As well as you can find me on some other podcasts, including a new one that's coming up. Pretty soon, where we're going to review a series that's been around for over 50 years as well. Hint, hint, hint. No, I'm not going to give any hints. Same channel, same time. You know, that's that's the only hint that I'll give you on the series Ooh. that we're reviewing. So uh, you can find me there as well as uh, check out the books that I'm working on. Uh, Tiki Zombie, new issue of that coming out pretty soon, as well as some other fun books that I'm being part of. So you can check all that out at newlegendmike.com. 
Awesome. Uh, and if you like this episode of the podcast, check out more on WatchYourAssalon.com. You can also find our podcast, our Patreon, and more at Linktree slash Watchathon. I also want to give a special shout out to Vince and EL for providing us with our amazing theme song. Thank you, Vince. Check out more of their music at vincentel.bandcamp.com. And tune in next month when we talk about Tooth and Claw. There's a werewolf in it. Oh. No. Yeah. But until next time, keep calm and wrestle on. Goodbye, and I love you in a platonic, parasocial way. Bye. Oh, baby, I'm beating out a samba. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.